just staying in your quietude, being with your direct experience right now. Begin with an aspiration for the sake of all beings, those we know, those dear to us, those unknown to us, enemies, difficult beings in our world. May there be wisdom, compassion, and letting go. We'll begin today with uh, a practice for a period of time and then move into some words of wisdom far greater than mine that hopefully I can uh, interpret and share in terms of the Dharma tonight. Wonderful to see some new faces, some faces I haven't seen in a while, people in our Dharma family who we love deeply and broadly, and just lovely to be here um, without a screen between us. <laughs> Neil has very kindly um, gone to great lengths to uh, film, um, practice streaming tonight's talk for folks who don't live locally and might like to uh, join us virtually. Um, so that's what this is about to benefit some folks who through the COVID time, which has obviously not ended, uh, I was teaching online and some of the students from Vancouver, et cetera, were joining. So we thought it might be nice to open up our, our blessed Nanaimo gathering where we're able to gather to a few people who might want to join us virtually. So tonight is just a practice run of how that might work. So we'll practice together for oh, about 20 minutes or so. And this evening, I'd like to work with the, the simple, direct practice of breathing. Last session, a couple weeks ago, we worked with open. But if you're unfamiliar with the practice, I'll give a few brief instructions. If you're familiar with the practice, as many of you are, you can move into your practice right now. But I'll remind you of posture, uh, taking an alert yet relaxed posture. The mind will actually settle a bit better if your spine is straight. And so
you'll also invite the mind with a bit of a ritual before you enter into the practice more specifically by setting up these beginnings. So, a fair bit of explanation for a very simple thing. Imagine that dropping down from the ceiling, there's a rope or a thread or a cord. And imagine that you're like a marionette. You have a tab right on the crown of your head. If you wish, you can uh, do what I'm doing. Tap your fingers there. And you will find that it's a little more sensitive at the crown of your head. If you tap a little bit farther forward or back, it usually won't feel the same. There's a strong uh, energetic connection there that can be helpful for helping the mind to slow and settle. So imagine this rope tabs on to the tip top crown of your head like you're a marionette doll and that literally Neil or someone is operating a winch that pulls you upward and I mean you to do this physically. Imagine you're being pulled upward. You're seeing I'm stretching upward. I'm probably gaining three centimeters when I do that. It's reminding the spine of alignment. It can help encourage what are called the central channel and the side channels in Tibetan practice. Some of you have some familiarity with that to open. So you want to stretch upward, really stretch up, up from the crown, and then just gently sink back down. I also invite us to raise our shoulders just, just a bit, about a centimeter. This is not a stretch. This is an invitation to release. Raise your shoulders a little bit. Gently roll them back and imagine the shoulder blades sliding back down. This is not a whim of mine. This is actually drawn to some really deep teachings that can help the mind settle. So I encourage you to give it a try. Gently rising up, gently rolling back, really gentle, more like an invitation, and then sliding back down. You may notice a sense of emotion in the chest. You may not because this also opens up the heart center, another area of meditative connection. Uh, most of us, in our own ways, tend to protect the heart, and opening it up can be very skillful on many reasons. We can talk about another day. Stretching up and down, opening the heart, relaxing the shoulders, checking in with the chin. Perhaps, like me, you tend to jut your chin, collapses in the neck, uh, stops the energetic flow, doesn't stop it, but makes it more staccato much more helpful to check in with your chin. I suggest you place your thumb under your chin, just touching, you're not pushing at all. And then press down with the chin onto that static thumb, pressing down onto that thumb. It again sort of reminds the cervical spine, the neck, into alignment. A lot of us are either a judder or a collapser. Both of these will also make it harder, believe it or not, for the mind to settle. So stretching up, settling down, opening up, checking alignment here, and then belly. Depending on what kind of trousers you're wearing, you may want to unsnap. These are quite loose, so I won't, but unsnap if your trousers, this is actually really important. Uh, it helps you go into deep meditation when you get more advanced if you let the belly open. Classic teaching, you'll notice statues of a Chinese-style Buddha, big, fat, laughing belly. All those symbols are related to meditation. And that's a, a loose belly, an open belly. So if you're wearing uh, elasticized um, pants, you may want to pull that down so that the curve of your belly falls open. It will be plump, even if you're a very thin person with very little body fat. When you release the belly, belly like a pot. And finally, I'd like you to either imagine or actually place a touch of a smile on your lips. Think the Mona Lisa smile, or a Buddha statue from the Theravada or the Thai, the Burmese tradition, this sort of noble looking statue with just a hint of a smile. You can come look at this one at the end of class if you wish. If you imagine that, it changes your biochemistry. If you place a ghost of a smile on your lips, it changes your biochemistry. And again, this is based on 2,500 years of training, not personally, but many before. This helps the mind settle. Straight as your pre-flight safety check. And then letting all that just slip away. And simply being right here, right now. If the mind is busy or scattered, you might have to rush to get here. You've had a 
demanding mental day for some of us, etc. You might want to start with a bit of grounding into the body, feeling your butt on the chair. The body's here and now, in this present moment. The mind may be in the past or the future. So grounding into the physical body can be a skillful way to start to gather the mind, gather the intention, the attention into here and now. Don't worry, I'm going to stop talking soon. <coughs> and then when you're ready, you might want to stay with focusing on the feeling of the chair on your buttocks or the feet on the floor, the contact, especially if the mind is scattered or busy, grounding. And when you're ready, moving into mindfulness of breath, I suggest you choose either the belly, the diaphragm heart center, or the tips of the nostrils and the tip of the nose. Choose one of those. If you don't know what to choose, choose your heart center and your chest. And when the instructions are given, they're often not given very thoroughly, pay attention to your breath. That's a very vague instruction. The more meticulous instructions given by the historical Buddha are to pay attention, there's many, many instructions, but the one I'm synopsising here, is to pay attention to the physical sensations of the breath. What does that mean? Well, that means as the body breathes in, you may or may not notice physical sensations. Let's say you're focusing at the heart center, the chest, the diaphragm, the on the inhale, on some breaths, you may notice a subtle movement in the chest. Other times you may not, that's fine. You're observing, you're investigating. Uh, you may or may not notice a sensation. You don't get any extra points if you do or don't. But it's the, it's the investigation that's important, not so much the fine moving. So you're attending as carefully as you can to any sensation or maybe lack of felt sensation as you breathe in, as the body breathes in. There may or may not be a little gap at the top of the inhale. Sometimes there's a pause, sometimes there isn't. Each breath can be different. Notice any physical sensations there. Then there'll be the beginning of an exhale on an exhale. You attend as closely as you're able. You place the attention as closely as you're able, as though your life depends on it, to the sensation of there may or may not be a small pause at the bottom of the exhale before the body inhales once more. The mind will probably resist the invitation to pay close attention to a single breath. And it may go chasing after something that seems more interesting. A story, a plan for getting groceries on the way home. May go backward in time, something that happened today, last week, years ago. <clears throat> may be distracted by air movement in the room, warmth and cool, or the sounds of the fans, or my voice. May be distracted by physical sensations, maybe your tummy rumbles, or your ankle hurts, etc. That's just stuff arising and passing away. What you're inviting the mind to do, what you're inviting the attention to do, it may refuse the invitation, but you're inviting it. Please, attention, let's really focus on this single breath. When the mind goes somewhere else, as it will, perhaps dozens or hundreds of times for some of us through this short sit, no problem. When you realize you're not paying attention to the sensation of a single breath, that's a win. That's a moment of awakeness, a moment of showing up to what's actually happening and pulling the mind out of its distraction. And you begin again with the breath you're on. And you repeat. It's very simple. It doesn't mean it's easy. But it's very simple. Attend carefully to the sensations of this single breath. That's it. And then repeat. So we'll practice together for a period of time. I'll mainly move into silence relief to some of them. I may drop in the occasional reminder and call any wandering minds back to the breath. And at the end of the sit, I'll ring the bell three times. And I invite you, when you hear that first bell tone, don't throw it all away. Don't uh, just give up. Meditate through the second tone and the third tone. The 
before you open your eyes. Side note, if you have an established eyes open practice, feel free to practice that. But for the majority, it probably will be most beneficial this evening to practice this practice, this concentration practice, this training the attention practice with eyes open.
mind right now. If it was anywhere other than focusing on the present breath, no problem. This is an invitation to begin again with the breath we're on. <coughs>
last few months have been sick, can you begin again? Never waiting for it to end, just being with one breath. Take a moment, as I spoke about last meeting, our first meeting, you and I in person, just take a moment to briefly review the meditation. Nothing fancy, just, oh, the mind is quite sluggish and quite sleepy, a lot of drifting thoughts, a few moments where things felt quite pleasant. There you go, something like that. But bringing attention, metacognition, where you're thinking about your thinking, so to speak, your mm, thinking about your meditation. The Buddha said, uh, study, meditate, contemplate. A lot of times in the West, people meditate. They don't necessarily study much. Uh, you're studying by hearing the Dharma and contemplating. So just being introspective about the experience itself. And one of the things my root teacher, Nandra Rinpoche, used to say is take a moment after every meditation briefly review. It's classic teaching as well as we need to know. I tend to forget that sometimes, so no worries if you do too, but I'll attempt to remind us here. Brief review, check in with the mind, check in with the meditation, let it go. So this evening I want to talk a little bit about the three characteristics of existence according to the Buddha talk a little bit about this wild and precious human life, talk about mortality, and talk about urgency. So we'll see how it goes. That's what I have in mind. You'll notice the conspicuous absence of notes, so we'll see how it goes. In classical Buddha Dharma teaching, the three characteristics of existence are dukkha, anicca, anatta. Those are the Pali words, the language that was spoken at the time of the Buddha and that he would have taught in. Yes, I will translate them into English if they're new to you, as they may well. Dukkha translates in English, often it's translated as suffering. 
A better interpretation, uh, translation into English of the word dukkha is actually unsatisfactoriness. I'm going to get back to that and talk a little bit about it. The second characteristic, dukkha, anicca, anatta. Anicca is impermanence. Everything ends. We die. A glass of water, uh, the water's there, and then it takes a different form inside my body when I drink it. Each breath you were attempting to attend to this evening had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and that breath will never occur again. Impermanent. We'll talk a bit more about that in a minute as well. Dukkha, unsatisfactoriness or suffering. Anicca, impermanence, change. And anatta, lack of self, non-self. For tonight's purposes, the ego self we identify with, the Neil, the Cheryl, the Brent, the whoever, um, that's our sense of self. And when people poke our sense of self, sometimes we react, sometimes we don't. But think of something you hold dear. I'm gonna make a sweeping guess, probably an accurate one, and say that everybody in this room um, thinks animals should be treated kindly, whether you're a crazy pet lover like me or not. You probably think, you know, cats and dogs, we'll limit it there for a moment, should be treated kindly. And if someone says to you, I've got currently three cats and two dogs, a partridge and a pear tree. Um, if someone were to say to me, I, I identify, I, Cheryl Fraser, identify quite strongly as being an animal lover. So if someone were to say, oh, Cheryl Fraser, you know, is cruel to kittens, that would be an assault to my sense of self. And I would probably feel offended. That's not true. It's ridiculous. It's not me. So there's a really simple, rather idiotic example of how we react when our sense of self is poked. Mm -hmm. Someone misunderstands you and says, you know, oh, Neil's a bigot or something. You're like, no, I was totally taken out of context. That's a vast teaching. We'll have lots of classes about it and over time. Some of you are quite familiar with this idea. To some, it may be very new. But the third characteristic of existence is that there isn't a permanent, ongoing you. It sure feels like there is. You're 30 years old, you're 50 years old, you're whatever years old, and it feels like there was me as a kid, there was me as a teen, there was me last year, there was me this morning, and there's me now. It feels kind of continuous. But are you the same exact person as you were when you were driving here? It's an interesting question to ask yourself. Well, I kind of feel like me. I was driving here, and then I said hi to Neil, and then I sat down, and then attempted to meditate. But you're quite different in all sorts of microscopic and sometimes big ways than you were 45 minutes ago. You've lost hair follicles, and, and you've shed skin cells, and you've had all sorts of thoughts, and maybe emotional variations, feeling a little irritated, feeling a little sleepy, remembering something you, you forgot to do earlier. Many, many changes have happened to the being you were when you pulled into this parking lot or walked in or rode your bike in or whatever, and where you are right now. So the three characteristics of existence, now listen to that phrase, it's not mine, it's the Buddha's, characteristics of existence. This doesn't mean optional. This doesn't mean everybody but Brad <laughs> suffers, you know. Everybody but Richard will find out things are impermanent. It means it's a characteristic of existing that there will be some unsatisfactoriness or suffering, I'll say a bit more in a minute, that things will change. Anybody notice that? Anybody notice that uh, your love affair that's so great in the beginning isn't always great in the middle? Ever notice that uh, the meal you make is there and then you consume it and it's gone or at least it's in a different form? Of course you have. Ever notice that the weather changes? We live here, ooh, pick a moment. That's a Nietzsche, the second characteristic of existence. And the third is this non-self that we suffer so much because we believe there's a me that is this and is this and is this, and we therefore protect it quite ferociously in ways that can lead to suffering. Again, that's a whole other talk for another day. I'm going to touch on that one lightly this evening and talk more about the first two characteristics of existence and a Nietzsche, suffering or unsatisfactoriness and impermanence. Now, anybody here ever have physical pain? If your hand's not up, you're either in a coma or a light. Of course we've all had physical pain. Anybody here ever have emotional pain? 
right? Anybody here ever lose someone or something you love? The truth of suffering is not a negative teaching. I used to think it was when I first heard about Buddha Dharma. You know, life is suffering, which is incorrect. But sometimes it's put forward that way. No, no, no. The teaching is that in a human or any other sentient being's life, there will be some suffering. There'll be some physical and emotional pain. There'll be some circumstances we don't want. Someone we love is killed in a car accident. Uh, we get evicted unfairly from our home and are scrambling to get a roof over our family's head. We get fired. We stub our toe, everything from the small to the vast. There will be some suffering. Yeah, we all agree. So yeah, I've had some physical pain. Yes, I've had some emotional pain. Yes, I've lost. But the vaster teaching is part of being a sentient mortal being in a human or we'd say other sentient being, animal, etc., body, but we'll stick to human for now is there will be some suffering. Well, interestingly, the second characteristic of existence, the anicca part, the impermanence part, explains why we suffer. We suffer because something changes. Our toe is unstubbed and not hurting us, and then it changes, it becomes stubbed, and it hurts. Uh, the relationship, the food, the, the, the temperature we like, warm or cool, changes, and then we have a little bit of unsatisfactoriness, a little bit of unpleasantness, reminding you that the translation that's usually given for that first word, dukkha, is suffering. And I said, mm, a more accurate translation is unsatisfactoriness. Suffering to most of us in English sounds like a big word, right? I suffer, that's big. And we certainly have huge sufferings. Old age, sickness, and death for some of them. But little tiny dissatisfactions, little, like a, a little piece of hay in your shoe, and it's just tiny and it's vaguely unsatisfactory, but it's not hurting and you're not getting a blister and it's not really painful. These are sufferings as well. And they're born out of change. There wasn't a piece of hay in your shoe and then one crept in there and now there's just a little, right? I, I walked in and I really enjoyed the freshness of the heat pump and the fact that it's cool in here. But now it might feel a little too cool, depending what we're wearing. That's a little subtle unsatisfactoriness. Doesn't mean we're suffering, but it's really important to contextualize that that characteristic of existence of dukkha or unsatisfactoriness or suffering is from the tiniest little, almost unfeelable, almost imperceptible dissatisfactions and the vastest, most gut-wrenching physical and emotional suffering. I'm not being a downer, I'm speaking the truth, not my truth, our truth, that we know in our human life there is some suffering. There's also profound joy. Anybody here ever experience profound joy? Anyone here ever experience love? Anyone here ever do something that you just felt wonderful, you were able to help that person? Anybody here ever eat a beautiful, fantastic piece of chocolate very slowly? Much joy. The joy of watching your kids, your grandkids, the joy of laughing with a friend, the joy of coming here, whatever states we're each in tonight. They'll change, that's that second characteristic. Anybody ever notice you can be in a neutral or a good mood and then suddenly you're just feeling restless and crabby and unpleasant? Sure. These are characteristics of existence, but why is that important? My teachers used to say, I'm sure other wise teachers said too, you know, Namjo used to say, the Dharma's about suffering and the cessation of suffering. If it's not about suffering and the cessation of suffering, it's not Dharma. Lots to unpack there for another day. If the Dharma, the teachings of awakeness, were not also about the cessation of suffering, we should all get out of here now. Because if it's only about the suffering part, if it's only about the impermanence part, if it's not pointing us in directions to say, and now what? How do we cope with the fact that everything is mortal? Everything changes. That into these human lives, grief and loss will fall. How do we cope with that? Well, we can drink ourselves stupid. That might work for a while, not a great long-term plan. We can run from reality, bury our head in work, never uh, get involved in close relationships in case we get hurt again. We do all that. That will work for a while. Or we can face the truth of the characteristics of existence with bravery, maybe linking arms so we're caught in it alone with each other and say, sometimes life is really, really hard. 
but there's a flower over there. Or I heard a story on the news of someone who jumped in to save a guy who jumped in after his dog and all three of them survived. There's beauty everywhere. The Dharma tells us, please stop fooling yourself. Please look at the truth of reality. Everything changes. We're going to lose things. We're going to die. What are you going to do about it? I said tonight I was going to talk a little bit about the three characteristics of existence as explained by Shakyamuni Buddha and other wise teachers. I also said I was going to talk about uh, loss, I was going to talk about mortality, and I was going to talk about urgency. Let me jump to urgency. Get on with it. Stop wasting time. We don't live for long. What are you doing with this one wild and precious life? What do you know it would be beneficial to do less of, starting now? And what do you know it is beneficial to do more of? Maybe give more of your time to charity. Maybe hug the people you love in a COVID-safe way. Maybe tell people you care about what it is you like about them. Maybe be a little more attentive to your health, your food and your movements, so your body, this beautiful body, lasts a bit longer with maybe a little bit less pain. Meditate. The Buddha said, meditate like your hair is on fire. It's in one of the suttas. What did he mean? Literally, your hair is on fire? Not really. He, mean, he meant urgency. Quit messing about. We keep waiting till later. We're going to retire, and then we'll buy a camping trailer and go explore this beautiful island. We'll wait until the kids graduate or go to the university or we pay that off, and then we'll take a trip. We keep waiting. Ah, after my birthday, I'll start eating better. After Christmas, I'll start exercising. This isn't a, it's actually, I hope, a motivation to say, take a look and pick one small thing, if that's a good place for you to start, that you know doing less of that would be beneficial to you. It might be hanging out with certain people. I'm just keeping it real. You may love certain people. They may be decent human beings. But if they have certain mind styles and certain ways of being that is difficult and consternating for you, and maybe they're a very negative person, you might want to limit your time hanging out with them. Love them. Hang out with them when you're feeling strong and robust and they're kind of negativity, dark cloud like Pigpen and Charlie Brown, you know? He'd walk around with a big cloud of dust. I love pig pen. But some people are like that energetically or mood-wise. Love them. But don't necessarily hang out with them all the time if it brings your mood down. I know that's a little tough to hear. Aren't Buddha supposed to be compassionate? Yeah. We are. And we try. I fail. I try. I, try. I fail. It is incredibly compassionate to yourself with urgency to not drag yourself down by being around people who sort of their energy plays to the darkness in your energy and it brings you to states where you're less compassionate, you're less helpful, you're less available. A few of you might not come back after this talk, but I'm willing to take that risk because I want you to contemplate what I'm saying. What is one small or large thing that you know you would be more calm, more loving, more happy, more grounded if you reduced it some? What is one or more things that you pretty darn sure you'd feel more calm, more grounded, more loving if you did a bit more of it. It might be as simple as meditating or reading a little bit of wholesome, positive Dharma teachings or other maybe beautiful poetry to put your mind in a more state of uh, elevation. It might be watching less TV and going on more walks. I'm biased, obviously, or I wouldn't be sitting up here. I am of the firm belief Part one of 25 years or more of this practice, that one of the things that benefits this being makes me a kinder, calmer, happier, more patient Cheryl is meditation and practicing Dharma, being around my teachers, and being around like minded people. That we can be crazy together. When our friends say, You're crazy to go meditate for three months. Well, none of my friends say that, but they're a pretty carefully chosen few. They're all like, Yeah, do four months. But, that's not a popular uh, consensus, I spent 13 years in university. 13 years, three degrees, two years postgraduate, post-PhD work. Nobody thought that was wacky. Not a single thing, not a single person ever said, 
why on earth would you go to university for four more years? No one. It was just generally accepted in our culture that that makes sense. The first time I did a three-month meditation retreat, I can't tell you the amount of people that said, why on earth would you ever do that? That's weird. 13 years. Oh, yeah, go for it, Cheryl. Three months. Oh, that's weird. See, we, we don't understand what's important. Education's important. I'm not saying it's not. I hope it was, or I wasted 13 years. It had a bit of value. But three months of studying the mind, three months of studying the characteristics of existence, three months of watching your breath and noticing in a single breath there are a hundred uh, risings and passings away, really getting that we're all going to die because every breath dies, really maybe not waiting till after we're 65 to do the things that matter. This is important. That's meditating with your hair on fire. That's urgency. I'm hoping to light a little urgency to you're here for a reason. Each of you has your own variation of that reason. You're in pain. You're seeking a little bit of solace. Maybe you're doing OK. You're seeking a little bit of a reminding of things that work for you. Maybe you're testing the waters to see if these sorts of teachings shared by me or people more skillful or more your flavor than me have value for you. Most of us, not all of us, most of us come to the Dharma because of pain. A uh, dear friend of mine used to say, well, Cheryl, there's stick people and there's carrot people. Most of us are stick people. We came to the Dharma because we were being beaten by the stick of pain. Anxiety, grief, loss, sense of general, what's it all about? What's the meaning of it? I'm doing all the right things. I've got the family, the kids. I do a job I care about. I give to the community and I'm still unhappy. A few people are carrot people. They're like, I'm pretty good, but I'd love to learn how to be great. And they go toward the carrot. I wish I was one of those. No, I'm a stick person. I came to the Dharma because I was in absolute despair, suicidality, tremendous anxiety, and I wanted to figure out why. And 13 years of university, science, medicine, and psychology did not answer the question very well. So I kept looking. Kept looking in a slightly different way than the Western psychological and Western medical view of mind and experience. By the way, I'm quite a fan of the Western psychological and Western medical view. I'm not dissing them. But how many of us got answers there as to why our experience was what our experience was? The Dharma gives it to you in some pretty pithy, pithy quick teachings. Well, you're mortal. You act like you're not. You keep waiting till later to do the good stuff. And you don't understand what the good stuff really is. It's not having a private jet and bajillions of dollars. Was that Nickelback song? You know, we all want to be big rock stars. Pretty funny if you think of it as tongue in cheek. Like there's a Duca song, right? You got your whatever. Oh, I used to know the lyrics well. I'm sure they're gonna run through some of your heads now. You get all the things. Well, if that worked, then rock stars and famous people and actors and uh, Robin Williams and so on and so on and so on wouldn't suicide or overdose because they'd be super happy if that stuff worked really well to deliver you from suffering. What works really well to deliver us from suffering, don't take my word for it, don't even take the Buddha's word for it, start studying and learning from your own direct experience. You are happy when your mind's happy. You are content when your heart is content. Now, if someone gave you a fantastic car tonight, think of your dream car, no price tag at all, like just, it could be a $200,000 one year, shumash, shumash. Think of your dream car and imagine you, you, you want to, you want to, raffle tonight, you got your green car, you'd probably be happy. I would be too, for a while. It'd be really nice to win a beautiful, expensive car. But that's not the answer to, to lifelong satisfaction, is it? We all know that. We've all had our own variations of what I just, you know, somewhat mockingly put out there. We've got the job we wanted, we fell in love, we, uh, um, you know, especially now when rentals are so hard to find on Vancouver Island, or at least on the South Island, right? You found a great place to live that you love and it's affordable. These are great. Enjoy the heck out of them. But they're not going to keep us content over the long term or we'd all not be here. We'd be hanging out in our rental with the person we fell in love with or whatever the other example I gave. Driving our fancy car. Please don't misinterpret. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with possessions. There's nothing wrong with beauty. There's nothing wrong with um, creating circumstances that are lovely. But when we misunderstand and we think that's the answer to continuous well-being, we suffer. So most of us in this room and elsewhere 
that start to become curious in training the mind through meditation. Uh, you may come to learn meditation and not even know what Dharma is and maybe not be interested in that part, that's fine. Often people in the Western uh, world now come to meditation uh, for, to reduce stress, to improve sleep, uh, to work with anxiety disorders. There's some value to that. I'm a big fan of reducing relative suffering. But meditation was not taught by the Buddha uh, as an aspirin. It was not taught, here, take this, you'll feel better. The Dharma, really looking at the truth of existence, comes along with training the mind and training ourselves in meditation. And that's uh, one of many teachings I'm offering this evening, the three characteristics of existence. There's going to be some suffering and lots of beauty, grace, joy, compassion, bountiful, kindness. And that's mainly because things change. We are mortal in a hundred years, barring a few of you younger folks and some crazy changes to um, medical technology that might happen. But for the most part, 100 years from now, none of us are going to be alive. Don't shoot the messenger. As uh, is said, you know, uh, being born is a terminal condition. It only ends in one way. So we wanted to talk a bit about mortality. So much loss in the last year, year and a half, due to uh, the COVID virus and complications thereof. So much loss now in Afghanistan and other places, war-torn. And all sorts of dreadful things. So much loss in this room in the last year or so. I'm not privy to all of your stories. And I know there's losses you're holding in your heart right now that I don't know about because we haven't spoken about them. But in this room, we've lost moms, we've lost sisters, we've lost partners, we've all lost a dear darling friend and our dear Sonny. So many losses because we're mortal, and these precious human bodies wear out. Sometimes through sudden death and accident, sometimes through, as the Buddha, what turned the Buddha's mind to awakening, why he left his palace, his rarefied life, why he left even his princess bride and his young son, was because he saw the truth of old age, sickness, and death. Not all of us make it to old age. We'll all have some sickness, and we'll all die. And that woke the Buddha up. He lived in a palace. Everything you can imagine, the rock star lifestyle of 2,600 years ago in India. But it, he realized in those moments of clarity that that wasn't going to do it. <clears throat> Having the most beautiful food and dancing girls and beautiful animals and everything being kept away from Prince Siddhartha. And he never saw a sick person. It was protected. He never saw a corpse. He didn't know what death was. They must have got rid of the dead bugs really quickly around that house. This is the story, the fable, the myth, the truth, I don't know. That he was protected from any knowledge of old age, sickness, and death. Why? Because he was a spoiled little brat? No, but because when he was born, allegedly the prophecy was, uh, and just think of, you know, he's a prince, his dad's a big cheese king. The prophecy was your infant son is it's one of two destinies. He's either going to be a tremendous leader, an incredible king to many, many people, or he's going to be a spiritual being. And the king's like, no, let's not go for the second one. I want my boy to lead, I want to be a benevolent, wonderful king, and to, and to help many people that way. So as the story goes, the whole palace was in a conspiracy to make sure that the prince never saw that life could be really tough. So he'd just kind of be happy in, in his paradise, in the, in the palace grounds. And one day the prince, you know, as uh, sometimes young men, boys, young girls, whoever are meant to do, uh, kind of talked a, a servant into breaking all the rules and taking him for a ride in a cart through the town in disguise, presumably. You can imagine that person got seriously fired when they got found out that they were the reason the Buddha became the Buddha instead of a king. So the young prince goes out and he sees you know, people in the marketplace and fishmongers and you know, cattle drives and it's fascinating and amazing. And then he sees someone who's walking funny holding a stick and bent over it and, and there's like maybe sores or leprosy. He says, what, what's that? Oh, well, Master, that's, that's a sick person. And they describe him what sickness is. He's stunned. And then he sees a really, really old person, hunched over and slow and wrinkled and the body changes. 
what's that? Well, it's age. What is that? Well, after you, you know, year after year after year, the body changes and deteriorates, and this was a terrible shock. And then he saw a corpse wrapped up in, in cloth. They wrap corpses in, in India, and elsewhere to go. What's that? And boy, oh boy, too many in this room have probably had to explain to a child, usually over the death of a pet, sometimes a grandparent, and whoever that first death was to a child. You know, what happened? What, why, you know, trying to explain that the person's there, or the animal's there, the being is there, and then they're not there, just their body is left. That's a really tough thing to wrap your head around when you're small, when you're big, and at our age. These drove the Buddha, the eventual Buddha, Prince Siddhartha at the time, to realize the truth of the characteristics of existence, that his infant son was going to suffer no matter how careful. The machinations of the palace tried to keep everything difficult from his own boy. That inevitably, the Buddha himself, which he was less worried about, because he was a compassionate guy already, but his wife, his child, all beings, all of us, were going to, if we live long enough, get old and sick and die, or we're going to die suddenly, or we're going to die young. And this woke him up to say, it's not about the palace, it's not about the things that make us feel good temporarily. Those aren't bad, they're not the answer, and that's where he famously struck out on the path to liberation. Liberation from what? Liberation from suffering. Remember what Nantra Rinpoche said, it's okay if you don't. He said, the Dharma is about suffering and the cessation of suffering. And it's not about the suffering, the cause of suffering and the cessation of suffering, it's not the Dharma. Very simple teaching. Why do we suffer? How can we suffer less? And eventually, maybe not suffer at all. So the three characteristics, suffering, impermanence, and how much trouble we get into when we strongly identify with this sense of self and don't realize that we're a very temporary phenomenon. From moment to moment, from instant to instant, we change. Who are you when you're fast asleep? It's a great thought experiment. I encourage you to go think about it this week. Where do you go when you're fast asleep? When you wake up, are you back? So who was there while you were asleep? Were you still you? Well, I was me, but I was sleeping. Right, but were you thinking, planning? Well, no, but sometimes I was dreaming weird, wacky stuff. Right. Where's the continu continuity of the barber that lays down at night and goes to sleep, and where she is at 3 a.m. Hopefully you're not insomniac, so hopefully you're fast asleep at 3 a.m. Don't know the particulars, but go with me here. If she's fast asleep, fast asleep at 3 a.m., where is she? Is she conscious of being Barbara? Not, like, and not unless you're having a super active dream. And even in that, we usually have to kind of half wake up and realize it's me having a dream. So don't take for granted that you're you all the time. <laughs> you're a body with consciousness and with conditioned patterns of thought and mind. Some of you will realize I'm going through the five skandhas here. We'll talk about that another time. But basically what makes up Cheryl is a body, sensations, perceptions, contents of consciousness, and consciousness itself. Those are the five skandhas, the five heaps, the five things that make up the sense of who I am. I'll teach a class on it soon. That makes up me. When we're asleep, our contents of consciousness are different. Consciousness is still there, but is it Cheryl? What wakes you up if you hear a teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny little meow, or quack, or moo, or dad? It's too quiet to wake you up from the noise. You slept through all the, hey, idiot, pull over, like around the neighborhood. But when it's meow, or plop, or dad, or hey, What's paying attention when you're asleep? Is it you? What's paying attention when you're asleep? Think about that. That's the third one. Anatta, dukkha, suffering or unsatisfactoriness, will be part of our human experience. Much bountiful joy and other things, but that will be part of our experience. Anicca, impermanence, everything else. We are mortal. The glass. Uh, is less than half full. <coughs> it changed. And this sense of self, when we start to examine these three characteristics, we can start to see windows to other possibilities. 
What if you were less identified with, I'm a pet lover, or I'm smarter than you, or I'm super generous, and someone says, man, you're selfish. And we went, oh, there's an opinion. What if it didn't land? What if we were less, I mean, goodness, the wars, Afghanistan, and everything else, it's all fought because we're so identified with ourselves, our view. Vaccination, no vaccination. Conservative, liberal, NDP, all of it's about identity. All of it's about subscribing to, There's this is, this is who I am, this is how I vote, this is what I believe. Well, aren't there do decent human beings in every political party? The answer would be yes. There's some decent human beings <laughs> in every political party. But we think, you know, our party are the good gals and guys. This is the root of suffering. Imagine a cooperative, benevolent, curious government made up of multi parties who work for the greatness of humanity. Yes. <laughs> Maybe one day. But we tend to polarize us versus them. All of that is that third characteristic of existence playing out in ways that are very unskillful and lead to great horror, genocide, etc. Is I'm me and you're you and we're different and I don't like your style. That may sound like an overreach, it's really not. And when we get deeper into that third characteristic of existence, the how much we identify with our sense of self, you'll begin to find out for yourself. When you're driving home tonight, you might see someone driving in a way that you find um, troublesome, annoying, incorrect. And you may find yourself having a really strong, quick opinion about that person. Usually, what an idiot. Think about that for a minute. Anybody other than me ever make a driving error on time? I'm a pretty decent driver, but you don't pay attention, or you turn a little too fast, or you miscalculate, and you think, eek, that wasn't my greatest moment. Am I an idiot? Well, if you ask anybody other than my husband, I hope the answer is not all the time. But I'm a human being that makes mistakes and errors, and yet we galvanize into ourselves. Look at that idiot. They're speeding, they cut me off, or they ran out late. I'm not suggesting those are skillful behaviors, they're not. They're moments of mindlessness. Moments of impatience, not paying attention, they're not very skillful. But we can polarize just like that to the idiot on the road. And then you're shocked that there's genocide? It's not that big of a step between the idiots over there who are bad or wrong and us. Wow, it's got pretty big pretty fast. But these are big teachings, the three characteristics of existence that lead to suffering. And mortality is a big one. Urgency says, I'm imperfectly saying, stop waiting for it to get better later. Do what it takes. Five minutes a day, if you're in a position to chuck your life and go into a six month retreat, great. If you're not, maybe you could if you tried harder. If you're really not, what can you do each day? Some of you knew Sunny really well. She was a part of our advanced Dharma group. She greeted many of you for many years. She was the door greeter. She was always the uh, manager of our, uh, our precious December retreat for at least the last decade eh? at Bethlehem. Sunny worked really early in the morning. And she got up and practiced almost every day for an hour or an hour and 15. And she got up. I, I may not have this quite correctly, but she got up at about 4 a.m. to make that happen, and then got the bus to her workplace, and practiced Dharma in her own unique way through the day. With customers, <coughs> on the bus, watching people. Was she a fully awake Buddha? Not that I know. Did she make mistakes? I'm sure. Sometimes did she say she had, you know, not the most wholesome thoughts? Of course. But I challenge any of you to say you don't have time to meditate. And so I'm gonna use her example, to kick our butts a little bit around urgency. I have a very busy life, too busy these days. But that's only an excuse, because all of us can set our alarm an hour early and practice, practice, practice. Yes? Can you differentiate a little bit between the ego and our sense of self? Not tonight. It's an excellent question, but I want to do a whole talk on that.
because it's very tricky and it would take quite a while. But it's a great question. Uh, and for tonight, uh, very, I'm actually glomming them together is essentially the same thing with different terms. Ego being more of a Western psychological word or sense of ego and that sense of self. I'm putting those together tonight. Okay, because uh, I know ego apart. is important when you're developing art. Arguably, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So a big talk, but bring okay. the questions back. Um, and then I would need to differentiate a psychological sense of ego and like a child getting a sense of who it is. One simple way it's put that I think is very profound um, in this sort of teaching, and I'm, as you know, a psychologist as well, is we need a very healthy sense of self to be able to transcend the self. So you've got to have a decent knowledge of kind of who you are, what your boundaries are, what's okay with you, not okay with you, pretty reasonably stable mental health before you can really go deep into non-self. So there's a little hint. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Jung, as in Carl Jung, as in there was Freud, and then there was Carl Jung, who is smarter. Um, mm -hmm. Carl Jung famously said, I may have the quote slightly incorrectly, but he says, uh, Carl Jung said that Buddhism was the only sort of religious training that made any sense, and he figured it would eventually take over everything because clearly it just made sense. He wasn't a Buddhist, but Jungian psychotherapy and, and Buddha Dharma have certain overlays. And Carl Jung said something along the lines of uh, the difference between uh, a Buddhist and my niece who, who has schizophrenia when they fall into non-self is that a meditator chooses to jump and a person with schizophrenia or other lack of knowledge of self falls. It's a little more complicated than that, but basically allowing ourselves in meditation to uh, sink into a place of non-self can be kind of scary. So you need a pretty strong ego, pretty strong sense of self, pretty strong, reasonable mental health. All of us here have mental health issues of some kind. I'm not saying you can't have any anxiety, depression, or anything. But there's reasons why I have people fill out questionnaires when they come on retreat, right? And there's some people who I wouldn't take into a non-self exploration right off the hop. So to synopsis that, you need a strong, flexible, healthy sense of what I'll call an illusory self. Mm. to then begin to realize it's illusory. But this is big. This is the, this is the big billion dollar Dharma question. <laughs> yeah, because you're like getting right self, self knowledge when you're meditating, aren't you? No. Yeah. And so it's, that's adding to the whole problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's really about the identification incorrectly that there's a solid me that doesn't change and that I need to protect. It's a very huge topic. It's a very intelligent question. And people should be wondering similar things because not just go, oh, okay, I don't have self. The first time I heard that teaching was approximately 1995. I was doing a postdoc uh, after my PhD in San Francisco, and I went to a group of um, psychologists and psychotherapists who were also interested in Buddhism, sort of a, just a gathering once a month. And I thought, oh, I'm going to join this because I was interested in Dharma and had a little bit of experience, not much. And they said, well, we thought we would talk tonight about the fact that there's no self. I never heard anything like that. I just spent 13 years trying to figure out how to have a healthy freaking self. And they said, there's no self. And it was as though I was speeding down the highway in my mental car and someone slammed on the brakes. Like I had this sort of shocking, my brain went, there's not a self, not because I understood it, but because it was incomprehensible to me that, if, well, of course I'm Cheryl, and of course I exist, and of course I'm a self, and you guys are a bunch of weird idiots, and I don't think I'm going to come back. It really shook me up. But being me, when something <laughs> shakes me up, I tend to get curious. And so I didn't get curious for a while. I kind of had to put it away for two years. But then I went back, what's this non-self like that? It makes no sense. So often when we hear these teachings, we can get quite irritable around that one, because the self's like, I do too exist! Don't listen to her! Don't listen to the Buddha, her stupid! So it's very interesting to go deeper into that topic, as you've now encouraged me to do, even though I said I wasn't going to, so well played. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the substitute teacher at Barbara's one going, tell us about your weekend! <laughs> no, I love it. Thank you. It's great to have you back. It's been far too long. So the three characteristics of existence, the first two are much easier to accept, right? We're all like, yep, there's some suffering. Yep, I'm dying with that. Yep, everything changes. Maybe not the mountains. Ah, come on, yeah. 
You know, in the, in the time it took me to say maybe not the mountains, leaves fell, you know, a deer went by and it caused a little small landslide. Uh, the mountain changed so much in the time it took me to say maybe not the mountains, maybe they don't change, everything changes. But then the not self one, Barbara tricked me, but I'm like, we're not going to talk about that one very much tonight. <laughs> it takes so much to unpack. But we don't get out of here alive. Which one of us will die next? Don't know. Be careful on the way home. I'm not being facetious. That's how quickly it can happen. So what do we do with this one precious human life? There may well be more. The traditional teaching of Buddha Dharma and other spiritual traditions say that there may be life after death, there may be reincarnation. I'm going to leave that for each of us to explore and maybe witness when the time comes. But for now, we know we've got this life, right? What are we going to do with it? it doesn't mean you have to chuck everything and go become a nun or a monk, although that's not a terrible idea for some of us. But you could set your alarm earlier, read something meaningful other than frickin' Facebook, and brew a beautiful beverage, and sit and watch the world start to come to life outside your window. You could do some formal meditation practice on breath, or with uh, dedication. With some of you have uh, worked with myself or Lama Mark on some of the Tibetan start the morning with a dedication. It can be as simple as, today may I be wise more often than I'm unwise, may I be kind more often than I'm unkind. I just made that up, by the way. But it can be a beautiful, just simple aspiration. It can be more traditional. One I use a lot here is, for the sake of all beings, may there be wisdom and compassion. That's a heck of a good way to start the day. Instead of, what's the news? What changes can we make? That's the urgency, small or large, right now. And with some consistency, ideally. Why? Well, because we're creatures of habit. And if we do something more consistently, we're more likely to stick to it more often. Three characteristics, mortality, and urgency. These were the things I wanted to share this evening. Just going to do a time check. So I'm going to make a couple of short announcements, and then I'll have a brief, about a five-minute meditation to just bring things to a close. Then I'll ring the bell. I'll dedicate the merit. Neil may share a few words, and then we'll uh, call it an evening for now. Uh, if you'd like to come say hello to me, Please do. So the announcements are simple. Um, I need to check with Neil and Wendy, but I'll be teaching at least two Mondays in September, maybe three. We just need to check and make sure the, the venue is available. I believe it is on Monday nights, but we need to book those evenings. So we'll send out a newsletter hopefully within the next couple days. I've got three dates for you to check out. Um, if possible, I will come uh, seven days from now. Not on the Labor Day Monday, I'll be out of town, and then the one after that. So hopefully in seven days and 21 days from now, but stay tuned, because maybe someone's having a birthday party here one of those nights that we don't yet know about. The second um, hopeful announcement, thanks to Neil and a couple of others, it looks quite hopeful that we will have the Bethlehem Christmas Retreat that, for those of you that don't know, has been a stalwart of Bailen Dharma for many years. Um, Bethlehem Retreat Center on Westwood Lake. And is it the 10th? Yes. The 10th weekend of December 10th. So about two weeks before uh, the Christmas holiday. Um, it's generally, uh, we start midday or at supper time Friday, and then all day Saturday, and then Sunday till the afternoon. All the details will come. We've reserved the date to figure out the logistics and we'll float it out there and if there's interest we will go ahead. Um, there'll be a residential option strongly encouraged by moi because if you leave your environment and immerse yourself for two or three days away from everything that can be much more powerful from your mind but hopefully we'll also have a non-residential option. This is all just being worked out where you can come um, early in the morning and stay till the evening 
have your meals on site, uh, but go sleep at home if you need to do that for some reason. So uh, this is good news. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully we'll go forward. It's been, a, uh, for many of us, I think it's a, one of our favorite weekends. Of the year. It certainly was for our dear son. He said that over and over again. So those were my little announcements. We'll, um, so more teachings to come, dates to be announced. We're just getting rolling. We'll get into a bit of a rhythm. Uh, as long as it remains safe and wise to do so. If circumstances in the province change, we will, of course, adapt accordingly for everyone's safety and well-being because that's what compassion is all about. Not just me, me, me. Benefit of all. So we'll sit together just for a few minutes. I'll ring the bell and we'll close with the dedication of Mary. And just allowing the talk to seep into you any bits that were important or helpful. Trust it will be there when you think about it on the drive home. And for now, you can just let it sink and settle like pouring a glass of water into some dry sand. It's absorbed. It's there. And just bring yourself to this moment. Noticing the sounds in the room. Noticing any sounds you register from outside the room. Happy shouts of baseballers. Notice sensations in your own physical body. Notice if your eyes are closed, visual phenomenon like shadow or light, even with eyes closed. If your eyes are partly open, or if you wish to open them for a moment, just notice visual stimuli. You look in front of you, it's not necessary, it's optional. With your eyes open, when you see colors, shapes, how quickly the mind turns that shape into a concept door handle, chair, the back of Alexis's head, how quickly the mind turns sensation, perception into concept. Any aromas, any scents, any tastes, any linger of peppermint from the peppermint you had before you came in, just notice it. Five sense doors, touch, taste, smell, sound, and visual phenomena. And the sixth sense, according to Buddha Dharma, is the mind sense, thoughts. Emotional tone, planning, concepts. Just noticing with curiosity. Like it's not your mind, it's just a endless TV station. Just checking in. What channels are playing in this mind right now? I mean, like right now. Some of you be very little thought. For others, there may be a cacophony. Just notice. slip away and just be breathing. 
gently paying attention. the single breath. And a dedication of the merit. By the merit of this strengthening activity of gathering together, of observing the mind, of hearing the Dharma, of contemplating, may there be a cessation of the poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion. May we embrace the truth of the characteristics of existence, being more moved towards wisdom and compassion making effort to be the most wholesome beings we can for the benefit of self and all beings. May all beings awaken swiftly. May all beings be free from suffering. May they live in perfect equity.